And I think we're moving and we've been moving, and I know you, you believe this as well, into an era where picking and selection can drive, ma I mean, you know, I have, I'm in some index funds, they're fine, but like when the market went down in March, they were down 10% and they haven't really recovered versus, you know, my own accounts where I picked Zoom and Twilio and Splunk and bought them when they were down and they've rocketed. And I think that continues for the next five years. Take 700, Jeff Richards. This is day four. We're trying to get a half an hour of good advice from Jeff. It's taken four days to kind of narrow it down here. Jeff, are you feeling tired? You look like everybody at the behind you at this point. <laughs> I hope I'm in better shape than these guys. <laughs> I feel good. I feel good. I, I, my wife and I have a new rule that we wake up every day and just say we're glad to be here. We can't bitch right. about the fires, the market, the economy, the politics. We just, we're happy to be here. You have such a good attitude. You are, uh, I've become, you know, only met you in person a few times. We've become good friends. The, uh, because we think alike. The, the whole idea of this series that I'm doing is, is it's the same thing. We're not panicking. There'll be, there'll be panic times again. You've been good enough to do two panic with friends. I, I've changed it up because quality of one of the first companies we talked about in March that you, you were long and I got long was Zoom uh, when everybody was panicking. You, you had been long and I was just like, yeah. And, and here we are six months later. Zoom gets better. I, I, it's impossible it isn't. My Wi-Fi sucks and the quality of this is great. I can, I can create a 30 minute, 40 minute video with you, send it off to editors, have the sync cut and spliced and up on the web. And I mean, Zoom, you know, everybody keeps talking about overvalued, undervalued. I, I don't want to get into overvalued, undervalued, but I don't see how. By the way, how about the fact that they scaled to meet global demand that nobody could have for, I mean, do you remember 10 years ago when Twitter had the fail well? I mean, Twitter would go down. Like the right. fact that Zoom scaled up, I have four kids sitting in my house using Zoom for school right now. I'm on Zoom, you're on Zoom. Like the fact that this technology platform scaled up to handle this is really insane. Like it, it's not, I don't, I don't think Eric gets nearly enough credit for the scalability that he built into this platform. It's incredible. Incredible. So this is a series I'm calling Investing for Profit and Joy, which is the name of my blog, because in the end, you, you, you and some of my guests epitomize this. We invest, we're lucky to do it, we smile, we, we try and keep a positive attitude. It's not, you know, we're not digging ditches, you and I. <clears throat> you know, we've worked hard to get where we are. I, I'm trying to inspire people. I believe the next generation is an investing class. You know, with rates at zero, you, know, you and I have these long conversations with rates at zero. What are you going to do with robots and rates at zero? What, you know, it is what it is. And like you said, with zoom, like I want to fly, I miss New York. I miss some of my friends in other places. Um, but this is just too, this is just too powerful to be I able to also, I, get on a plane and interrupt a week of your, of work time. Well, and you and I have also talked about the idea that, you know, when I look back at my parents' generation, you pretty much put your money in the market and it went up, right? So it was sort of like dollar cost average, the S&P, the NASDAQ, et cetera. And I think we're moving and we've been moving, and I know you, you believe this as well, into an era where picking and selection can drive, ma I mean, you know, I have, I'm in some index funds, they're fine, but like when the market went down in March, they were down 10% and they haven't really recovered versus, you know, my own accounts where I picked Zoom and Twilio and Splunk and bought them when they were down and they've rocketed. And I think that continues for the next five years. I don't think cruise lines are going to perform as well as tech stocks, right? I, there's going to be a gap between, you know, selection. And, and I think that's where the younger generation of investors on Robinhood, everybody makes fun of the Robinhood investor. They've got their shit together, right? They do their homework. They, they use the Peter Lynch model. They bet on things that they're seeing trending. I think it's, um, I'm pretty bullish on on the next five to 10 years for investors. Yeah, we, we had a period as a hedge fund guy got kind of run out of, you know, I pushed myself out of the business in 05, 06 saying, you know, why compete with indexes? And here I am 15 years later, believing that we have, and you know, with rates at zero, it's still, I think, indexing for 95% of people makes sense. You dollar cost average, you see red 10 days in a row, add a little. You see green mm -hmm. days in a row, sell a little. Like there's very simple, it's kind of like uh, instrumental understanding of green and red. And you can really, you know, double down when you see red months or, or sell a little on green months. The, um, 
but the joy of of the art the the ability to 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 pick like you said to just battle wits no different than gaming to once a year twice a year when the market sets itself up to to say you know i'm going to talk to smart people i'm going to make some bets yeah. we started doing in march who um would you closely associate of the three people behind you who what, who do you think is most like because <laughs> <laughs> it's like i have my oh, idea uh, oh, yeah, of course you can pick the good looking guy, guy. Yeah. Carlos, i'm along for the ride no you're, i, I so you're yeah the baby? you think you're the baby i'm the baby <laughs> <laughs> i have four kids so maybe I... <laughs> who do you think if that if that the tiger's there the baby <laughs> is found. Who in that movie? Who are who are you in that movie? I'm probably the guy on the roof because you know I don't think I could have hand, I don't think I could have handled that whole night. You but, uh, you got hammered and just fell asleep on the roof. I love that answer. answer. I love that answer. So you're just uh, asleep on the roof, and I'm talking to a uh, uh, an illusion. So um, you today are in uh, California, correct? I am, and it's the air is clear. We finally got our smoke under control. Thank you to our forest fighters who did an amazing job over the last month. Amazing job. Unbelievable. We went through a month of literally ash on our cars every day, the furniture covered in ash. It was, uh, and of course, everybody saw the pictures of red San Francisco. It was, it was a pretty crazy month. What do you think? I mean, there's some truth to the way these cities are run. We know this has been happening. I've been, I've been kind of banging the drum anti- going to San Francisco myself for four or five years and my partner Gary moved back to San Diego and what would it take for someone because you know, you're I mean GGV is is a, is a Silicon Valley is, is there something that, that could make you move well I think for one of my wife's whole family is in the Bay Area so oh. I'll be honest with you one of the primary reasons we're here is because of that and we love it we live in a town called Pleasanton it's a great town to live in we have great schools um, I think that living in San Francisco would be a lot more stressful. And I know several, well, not several, I know a lot of folks who've moved out of the city in the last six months. Some of them have left the state. Some of them have gone to Tahoe. Some of them have moved to the South Bay or the East Bay. I think one of the challenges we have right now, I tweeted out this article this morning about Seattle and all of the problems that they're having. One of the problems we're having is these cities got sort of fat and happy on tax revenue. Then people got apathetic to local government and let the wrong people get elected. The wrong people got elected who don't really understand how economics work and how important in particular small business is to the economy. And then the businesses get hollowed out because there's too many. Talk to somebody who's trying to run a business. It in London. It happens in New York. Yeah. Well, try, try to run a business on Fifth and Market in San Francisco. I, I have a friend who used to be an executive at Macy's. And he told me that they had to, they were, I don't know if they did or they were thinking about closing down the San Francisco Macy's. And he said, because there's so many homeless people sleeping in front of the building, we can't do anything about it. They come, there are people who come in and steal from the store and we're not allowed to do anything if it's under $500. So they just walk in and steal things and walk out. So I, I think we need to get, we need to sort of reboot and, and get the right people in office who understand that we, we can be compassionate but being compassionate means actually, look, we have, here's a stat for you. You know how many COVID deaths there have been in San Francisco this year? 90. Not many. Yeah, not that many. 90. You know how many uh, people died of drug overdoses last year in San Francisco? And by the way, it's going to be higher this year. 5,000. 440. Way bigger problem than COVID. And yet every day you walk down the streets of San Francisco and there are people shooting up, passed out. It's really... It's a really troubling scene. And so we've got to do something as a society to reboot the way we're thinking about how we deal with homelessness and drug abuse. It's really, it's, it's not only scary, it's sad. You walk down the street and it's really yeah, distressing. It was the other place and we're just like nine o'clock crept in and it was like the zombie apocalypse. And I'm, I don't have the answers, but I mean, if you live in these towns, you know, we need, we need people that actually have a, have an idea of how to do this. It's pretty. And so, so I don't even know the answer, but how does that affect, do you think that, I, personally, these trends were in place before COVID. Yeah, yeah. Midtown was not like a place where I was hanging out. Yeah. And someone said, let's do a meeting in Midtown. I was like, no. Um, right. You know, so, and when someone said, and I wasn't doing deals in San Francisco the last five years, you know, I think the last Silicon Valley deal we did was Robinhood in 2013. 
Mm -hmm. right? so, so the world had already... Find more of those. <laughs> <laughs> and to be <laughs> honest, one. yeah. But to be honest, Silicon Valley and FinTech was not a thing. Like I, right. I wasn't interested in robos and Wealthfront and you know, what was the last great innovation in- Well, we have Stripe, we have Square. Like those we are have some, later, those are, those are, oh yeah, Stripe is 2000. Stripe was 2007 or eight, I think. Oh, was that early? 2007, eight. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's a lot of people back. I'm talking about consumer financials. Yeah. Thought yeah. about New York for that. We have Plaid, we have Plaid infrastructure, FinTech. I thought that was New York, but I'm, I'm, I'm not. Plaid is based in San Francisco, yeah. Basically. But but anyways, look, I think well, that's the, infrastructure. But what I'm saying is like now that, you know, so the last investment we made, we're not like some top 10 firm, but we're, you know, we, we've been making, you know, made a hundred investments to, to be able to, to get above average returns outside of San Francisco has been doable since 2015. Yeah. Uh, how, does it change that much with this, with, with all the problems and the migration? Or do you think it's better for people like GGV? How are you guys thinking about it? Well, we've always, I mean, as you know, we've been a global investor for 20 years, right? So we're in, we've got companies in India, we've got companies in Latin America, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, Singapore, China, uh, and, and then the US. The US is about half of our portfolio. So the way we, we, the way we think about it is we pick sectors and themes and trends, and then we bet on them all over the world, right? So in ride sharing, we, we were in Grab in Singapore, we're in Didi in China. Um, you know, we, we love SMB tech. So we were in Square here in the US. We've got a whole, you know, big commerce, which I'm on the board of in the e-commerce space. And then we've got Xiao Hongshu in China and Alibaba in China and Wish in the US and Poshmark in the US and Peloton in the US. So we, we pick these global themes and trends that are big long-term trends and bet aggressively on them and then sort of try and help them play out over time. So it's funny, I was talking to one of our LPs last week and she said, we, we've had eight IPOs in the last 12 months. I know you guys have been on fire. And she said, but she said to me, she said, did you guys just time it perfectly to take advantage of the market? And I said, well, we started the process for all of these companies 12 to 18 months ago. We didn't know the market was going to was going to have a huge tailwind from COVID. But I said, if you look at our e-commerce investments, we were investing aggressively in e-commerce in 2012, 13, 14, 15, with the idea that it would shift. It would go from 16 percent to 50 percent of U.S. retail at some point. We didn't know what happened this year, you know, and we've had like five years of acceleration in, in six months. But I think if you bet these, and this is also tied to the way you and I think about public investing, if you bet on these long-term trends, you're going to get some gyrations and some volatility. And the same thing with private companies. All these companies I just mentioned had their ups and downs, right? Talk to John Foley about fundraising for Peloton. It was brutal. Yeah. But the long-term trend is there, and that's how you create these outsized mega outcomes over a long period of time. So I think for us, you know, what happens in San Francisco, what happens in New York, Seattle, Chicago, Austin, that will sort of play itself out. I do think over time, we will see more entrepreneurs in more parts of the country raise more capital. And I think that's, a, I think that's great for our economy. Great thing. Right? I, mean, it was, I think it's a win all around. More tech, more profits, more capital gains, more of the things that have fueled Silicon Valley. Now, the flip side is you could have people in other parts of the country saying, gosh, our housing prices are going through the roof, just like they did in California. But, you know, that's sort of a byproduct of, of rising incomes wherever you go. And a, and, a, and a fund your size, do you distribute at the IPO or do you, is that an event where you say we distribute the shares to people that want or how do you, how does a fund like that crosses over and companies go public in a year like this? How do you decide when to book your, just kind of inside baseball, how do you decide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we don't. Most funds distribute sometime around the lockup. Most VC funds will distribute shares, you know, around the lockup or shortly thereafter. Or, or during a secondary, right? So you're seeing a lot of companies do secondaries. Uh, usually they used to wait till the lockup was over. Now you're seeing companies do it before the lockup expires. For us, we've always been a little different. We've, we've you know, our slogan is go long. Uh, we, our typical hold period post IPO has been about two and a half years. And the reason for that has been, we, we have empirical data that shows the return from the point of lockup to the point where we're either distributing or selling, where we're, we're generating a lot of additional gains for our LPs. So it's something we've always kind of taken pride in. And, and, and I think you have to have that public market lens though to be able to do that, because you have to make some judgment calls as to which companies truly have a tailwind are gonna grow and generate you know, meaningful IRR and DPI from that point, and which ones you say, hey, we love this company, it's had a great run, the growth rate is tailed off, and we probably should start to exit our position. 
And we do think a lot about DPI, right? We are, I have 95% of my net worth tied up in GTV Capital. So I care a lot about, our founder used to say, you can't eat IRR. We think a lot about DPI. And so we, we usually, what we will do is sometime after the locked up, we will sell some portion of our stake, return capital to LPs, try to let some of it ride, set price targets, and then, and then- So you actually out. set price targets, because for people that don't know, IRR is internal rate of return. And a lot of people run around bragging, you know, and in a whole <laughs> market, even our IRRs, it's extraordinarily high. And we're proud of it, but DPI is, to me, always been, I'm 55, so it's always been the thing that matters is return of some cash. Yeah, so you can't, you can't what does DPI your, mean to- issues? can't pay for your kid's shoes with IRR. Well, I can't. Deep, 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 yeah. I can't. I, have bright, I don't have bright GPs. I can pay for it with my IRR. Yeah. No, the no, no. DPI no. stands for distributed to paid in, right? So if LP gave us $100, how much of the $100 have we given them back? Yeah. So I think for young investors out there, you know, you see, you see, you see VCs on Twitter, or whatever, and, and you see all these, uh, these dances around IRR and, and dunking. And trust me, it doesn't count until year 2000. Uh, there was a lot of uh, people that had great IRR that disappeared very quickly uh over the next two years and it, and it changed the generation of investors fred wilson like will not ride companies public like you know a lot of those guys they in 2000 a lot of companies went public uh they didn't book their gains and a year later they were zeros well i and, think that legacy is why a lot of firms today distribute at the lockup I think because it's also the empirical perfect. data would show you that you should not distribute at the lockup i mean i can i can That's share the data with you but I, I, wanna, I, I would love to see that because I also think that plays into, into Jeff. I've had this thesis that like the reason some of these IPOs are doing so well is yeah. that there's not as much supply when they go public because I think people have studied the data and like in a, like True Ventures hasn't sold their uh, Peloton. And, um, you know, for investors that understand public markets, like this is work that, you know, sell, the people that sold Shopify at the beginning got to be going smacking their head. They wrote it to Thank a billion man. dollar IPO and then it's, it, they sold. Well, look at Square. Square went out and had a market cap of $2.9 billion and it sat there for about a year and a half. And it had done a down round before. And it had done a down round with a ratchet at the IPO. Mm -hmm. It sat at a kind of $9 to $12 for about a year and a half until the public market start to, started to understand what they were doing. 3 billion, $2.9 billion market cap. Today it's worth $70 billion. So had you distributed Square at the lockup, you, you, you know, 80% of the gains, 90% of the gains in that stock came after the IPO. So I think, you know, the, the, I mean, if you just look at the software category alone, the class of 2017 IPOs are up 350%. Class of 2018, up 200%. Class of 2019, up 180%. So if you distributed at the lockup and missed that next 12, now part of that is low rates, market's been up, multiples are up, right? The, the average software multiple in 2014 was seven times next, or sorry, was four times. Pre-2014, the average software multiple was four times next 12 months. From 2014 to like 2018-ish, it was seven times next 12 months. Mm -hmm. Right now we're running at 11.1. Yeah. So we've had multiple expansion that's driven a lot of that, that value in those software names. But I think the other thing you're seeing is, you know, you mentioned Shopify or Zoom or Twilio. When these companies go public, they raise a big slug of capital and have a ton of money to invest in sales and marketing and go to market. And for many of these companies, the growth rate actually increases, mm -hmm. which is not something public market investors used to always assume that a company goes public and the growth rate just decreases. We're seeing it actually increase, right? Because they're getting better distribution. They've got more capital to invest. And then the hidden secret of the beat and raise model is when you beat and raise, you have additional free cash flow to invest back in the business, right? So you're, you know, if you look at, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but if you look at when Shopify went public, I believe they were spending something like 25 million a year on sales and marketing. Today, they're spending something like 500 million a year. Now it's work. They've created a hundred and ten, hundred and twenty billion dollar company, but like the market, the market they're going after is enormous. And obviously, I'm I'm on the board of Big Commerce. We're going after the same market. The market these companies are going after is so much bigger than anybody thought. I remember, right? You know, we we made a run at invest. We we made a run at investing in Twilio, one of my biggest misses when it was private, 
And I went back and looked at the memo and we said, if we're right, it's a three to $4 billion outcome. Twilio is worth $35 billion today. Right. I didn't buy it for real. I luckily had some shares from my fund, but I didn't buy it for real until it doubled after the IPO. So I didn't even get bullish on it. I mean, I owned it and I sold yeah. it immediately at the IPO when the shares were distributed to me. And it was like 4,000 shares or something. I was like, and, and then it doubled. Well, then it went down the Uber, blah, 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 you know, too it much. Bounced much around low because people thought AWS was going to And compete. then it broke out and doubled. I'm like, I don't care about the shares back. And I'm like, yeah. But I think, the, I think the lesson learned, and, and, and I, I, we can get into where we go from here. I, want to I, believe, that, yeah. I, I believe the reboot of the American economy is going to be built on technology. Yeah. And if you look at the companies that are leading right now, Nike, 83% growth in digital, right? Why? Because John Donahoe took over and they bet big on e-commerce. I mean, I don't know about you, but my Instagram feed, my you know, I'm getting ads for Nike.com all over the place, right? Yeah. They realize they can't sell through Amazon and, and live life. You look at the restaurant industry, who's going to lead the way? It's going to be Shake Shack. It's going to be Chipotle. It's going to be Starbucks. All of them have technology at the yeah. center of their universe. You look at the restaurant industry, the pizza industry, who's going to lead the way? Slice, driven by technology. Domino's, driven by technology. So I think every industry is going to reboot itself based on technology. Like think about today. If you were starting a restaurant today today you and i are starting a new restaurant what's the first thing we'd do if we're if we're chefs we'd say we gotta have good food but the second thing we do is say okay we gotta have a mobile app and we gotta have takeout and delivery yeah it, and i may want to have my restaurant have eight other chefs in it and cook everything for everybody out of one yeah. distributor but the but the customer experience but there's going to be an element of the customer experience that's going to be built around technology so i think you're going to see every single in industry get on an axis and, and look at the companies that are dying off, right? People are like, oh, Brooks Brothers died. I'm like, last time I checked, Brooks Brothers wasn't a terribly innovative company. Right. JC Penney, same thing. I mean, like, th these are not like Macy's is dying. Great. Well, I mean, these are companies that haven't been investing in technology for decades. Mm -hmm. So the reboot is going to be built around tech. Look at travel. Airbnb is all built on technology, right? And Airbnb is now bigger than all, I think all of the hotel chains combined. Right. It was whoever did that deal at the bottom was a great bond because it went down totally. with all the other stocks and people were and I, you know, we were investor in beyond pricing, which was a logistics yield management product for Airbnb. And no doubt, like I looked at the revenue numbers, it was a company was flying, uh, just taken in a big round and numbers dropped 80 to 90 percent for two, three months. But then something happened in those industries. Their numbers are already better than they were. They're back exactly. on plane and higher than they were in March. Whereas the hotel, the actual rental, the hotel industry is not. And Airbnb looks probably as healthy, probably healthier than ever because the brand is now further entrenched into people. Yeah. It's built on technology. I can get my refund. I don't have to deal with layers of this. And but Airbnb is built on technology, right? The fundamental experience there, you have a great experience staying in somebody's home, but it's built around technology. So I just think we're going to see healthcare, retail, restaurants. I mean, every, every industry. And so that's why, you know, look, we have historically low rates. We have a whole bunch of reasons the market's been running. But when you look forward, how can you not be bullish on Shopify and BigCommerce, Square and PayPal and IDN? And, you know, all these companies, they're going to power that. I just don't, I don't, I don't understand people who are short. Now you could argue that we could see multiples come down. Yes. That's that, the only that, argument. That's the only yeah, argument. We could, that we could sense. see, we, yeah, we could see that. Yeah. We will see that because that's, and we may only see it for a short time because we, people do panic. So, so, so I love that. The, so at least we got that the reboot of the American economy means, because I want to just end with looking forward. Uh, if we're looking forward, there's always the risk of multiple contraction, right? Doesn't matter how hard, and this is when it would happen. This because the government's, we're going to keep rates low until foreseeable future. Well, that's them now talking like God, meaning I know they're trying to keep rates low for the foreseeable future. I process it and the market is taking them at their word, but this is when shit can go wrong. Yeah, so, so yeah. right. In, so in March, right. we were like, it's too yeah. late to panic. And now we're in September. I'm saying it's probably not too early to panic right now. It doesn't mean you should sell. I'm just saying now's a better time to think about selling something. But in a world where you and I are long, going long, whatever we call ourselves, I'm more like this. Our logo's like 
That's the uh, social leverage logo. We don't know. Um, yeah. What is it that uh, gets you the most excited other than, as part of the reboot? What like two sectors that just like you can't, you know, are still where you're focused on? Uh, one is digital cash. So digital payments, right? I'm super long PayPal, Square, Adyen. Like if you ask me, yeah, Adyen breaking out again. That's the Dutch. Yeah, but like in five years, are more people going to be using Adyen than are today? Yes. Now, so could the multiple go up and down? Maybe. But like the trend, I don't know how you could argue the world is not converting to digital when it comes to cash and transactions. It, it's just, it's, it's happening. Same reason I'm long Apple. I'm long, you know, anybody that's riding that trend, I, I'm long. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one. I think two, a super underrated category is SMB tech. You know, we, we host it. We're hosting a little plug. We're hosting a conference on October 27th conference. I'll send you the link. Um, you know, square, uh, you know, Wix, Ring Central, like all these companies, literally we went back and created an index of these companies that focus on SMBs. $450 billion of market value created in the last decade in that space. Because if you go back to 2008, 9, 10. It's not that really, much in a consideration of the whole industry when you think of Well, I'm not, even, I'm not including things like Google and Amazon and okay. Apple that are obviously powering a lot of this. We're talking about pure play SMB tech companies. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when I look forward, 60% of America works for a small business, right? Our economy runs on small business, number one. Number two, small businesses around the world are getting access to the same technology. So I think that trend, you know, if it's 450 billion today over the next 10 years, it's probably two or three X that, right? And so, and, and by the way, every new business that gets created in the next six to 12 months is gonna be built on technology. If you're starting a pizzeria today, you're gonna to start it on Slice. Mm -hmm. Now, if you started it 10 years ago, it may take you a while to adopt new technology, but you're certainly not going to launch a new pizzeria today and say, I don't need mobile ordering. I don't need takeout. So all of that new business formation is going to happen on toast. It's going to happen on slice. It's going to happen on service Titan. It's going to happen on Procore. like all these technologies. By the way, these are all private companies that, you know, not to mention Square and Big Commerce and Shopify and all these other businesses, Wix, you know, GoDaddy sells the domain name. So this whole like you know, arming the rebels, the, the businesses that are being created, the local merchants. I mean, the hidden secret of our economy right now is there's a lot of people making a lot of money on Etsy, Shopify, big commerce. Nobody talks about that, mm -hmm. right? We, 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 we turn on CNBC in the morning and they're talking about Brooks Brothers going out of business. Who cares? Yeah, it's right? is $115 stock. Yeah, but I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of sellers on Poshmark and Amazon and all these platforms that are up and coming, not to mention the whole creator economy. We, don't, we haven't gotten there. Gen Z and the creator economy. That's my favorite. Massive opportunity. Yeah. So I, I just think that there's a, um, there's sort of a renaissance that's going to happen and people get lost focused on Fang, you know, Facebook and Apple and the, the big tech companies and they're huge and they're dominant and could argue we need to figure out something to do there. But look at the folks that are arming the rebels in creating the new economy and rebooting the economy. And if you could bet on those trends, I think you're going to make money over the next few years. So you've been very gracious. The, uh, some incredible picks. If people, I'll link people back to our podcast in March and April. So here we are in September. Uh, almost everything you said has, has come to fruition uh, in uh, August, September. Now we're October. Is there, is there a company that's public and then we'll talk about one private company here that you just love. Is there a company that's public that hasn't worked the way you thought it would work, even though it's been a great rally and looks interesting here? Because I know like CrowdStrike, we talked about at 50, it's 150. Peloton, we talked about it, I don't know, in the 20s, it's 90. So is there one that's like, company? what's that? Which company? Sorry, I missed it. Peloton, we talked about in the 20s. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, so, so within all the home runs, is there a company that stands out that hasn't made the move and, and we don't know why and maybe still could have a move in, in, in front of it that, that you are interested in? Yeah, I'll give you one I mentioned way back in March, Smartsheet. Uh, I think the, the whole thing Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah I've been watching I think, it. I haven't. It's kind of just gone between 40 yeah. and 60. Yeah, I mean, when I look at that, I think the trend towards low code, no code is a big opportunity. And I think they're sitting right in the center of that, number one. Number two, you know, if you look at the net dollar retention rate, I always look at net dollar retention rate for software companies. And anybody over 100% gets my eye because it means their business is going to grow without them having to, you know, theoretically without them having to book any new business. So it's a wonderful metric and you see it with Slack and, and Snowflake and, and others. 
so I, and they have a very high net dollar retention rate. And then third, I'm, I, I think a CEO is a superstar. Mark Mader is amazing. I, I went to college with him, but so disclaimer. In the but, um, in the yeah, exactly. But I, I think it's, uh, I just, I'm long the company. I like the category, as you know, in the private markets, Airtable and Notion and a bunch of companies that are raising money at big valuations. You can bet on that trend in the public market and ride it. But yeah, Danny, our analyst, CFA is an analyst for me and some deals on the side, stuff that I look at and we talk stocks all day and he's helped me out with Koifin. Um, we look at, he's very long uh, Adyen. He finally bought in on Adyen. He's a conservative guy and then so smart, sheet, yeah, smart, smart sheet is one that uh, we've been following closely just because you've had it on our mind. And, and as I see air, and as I even use Notion and Airtable, and see, have Danny teach me how to use it. Um, just because, you know, I wish I was younger because I really could use it, meaning I know how to use it, but I don't really need it. Me, you know, we're early stage investors, you know, you know, Ross and, you know, younger younger people, I totally get it. Like the power- but They don't have your golf game. Yeah, they have no golf game, and I have worked on that. <laughs> and so Smartsheet, just the canopy of that industry, the no code- Huge, you know, it's is, gonna be huge is huge just like yeah, we, we use we use notion internally it's a terrific product um but you just look at the flex we have a private company called trade.io that's in that space you just look at the flexibility that people have to sort of build and manage their i mean you go back to when i started at pwc in the 90s they gave you a laptop which by the way had the less processing power than an iphone and you had microsoft office with excel and that was it mm -hmm. today you've got all these amazing tools that you can customize build your own versions put them on the web. I mean, there's so much flexibility there. I, I just think that the things people are going to create are going to be, you know, it's like, it's like the next version of enterprise software, but it's all going to be created by people on their own in a bottoms up way. And it's a, and it's an exciting opportunity. I, I, you know, I wear this brand and I'm like, why doesn't Howard have his own brand? It's the same. This is Lulu with, with, this is the story that I'm going to tell you. This is Lulu with a better, it's, and Rafa appeals. Like, I feel like a cheat if I wear Lulu. Right, because I don't fucking do yoga. Right, I do two down dogs, and I two do, I have two down dogs, and I go to my slice app and get a, a slice of pizza. Whereas is Rafa, biking Rafa, a, Rafa is a biking and two guy English guy who designed the logo, and the, the Walton brothers bought him. So I wear this every day. I'm like, I'm an idiot. This is a Lulu shirt with a great brand. Obviously, I like Rafa because I do bike rides. So it's an affinity thing. But this should be an investing brand that that uh, I said it's the same material. So meaning I'm all day doing interviews, I should be promoting my own brand. So I, I, you know, for years, I'm like, I don't want to do a Shopify store. I don't want to do a Shopify. And normally in, in the world pre-technology, the longer you put enough an idea, it gets worse and worse because you're, oh, glad I didn't do that idea. You know, like it's a million copycat. In this world that we live in, the longer you wait to do your idea and build your brand or, or to get good at something, the better the idea becomes. Right. Because Shopify's now got 10 competitors that I could actually do a, I could open up a store specifically with the skills that I have on, you know, I don't even have to use Shopify. There's like vertical additions of it. Yeah. Then I could do learning from other people. I could do limited drops. So I don't have to like, it looks like I only, you know, in so every industry, I can right? start a business that's, out of the blue. But that's happening in every industry. Look at Substack is doing for writers. I mean, every industry is having this reboot yeah. where, Distribution is no longer controlled at the top by Condé Nast or, or a, a mall retailer, mm -hmm. and it's controlled from the bottom and it's bottoms up. And people are, I mean, Jesus, there are people, there are people building million dollar businesses on Big Commerce and Shopify in 12 months. Yeah, I will have a million dollar media business on the side in two years, on the side, just from advertising and sponsors and not even having to sell my soul like people that I products that I love and just doing my regular job and not having right. to spam people think but about I, every 25 30 year old today who is adept at using technology and looks at that and says I'm not going to go work at IBM for 30 years mm -hmm. right I'm going to go launch my own I'm going to I'm going to work at Google and launch my own thing on the side and when my own thing gets big enough off I go look at look at what Webb Smith is doing with 2PML right he's built a million dollar plus business you know, there's so many people in all these different categories that are doing that. And so I think that's the, again, I believe the world is getting better. That's my general investing thesis. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, politics and everything else aside, I think as the American economy reboots, it's all going to happen around technology and it's going to provide better cash flow, more profitability. Yes, we're going to have robots taking out factories, mm -hmm. but 
those folks will hopefully shift in and start new businesses in other categories. Yeah. So, so I think I'll end it. We got a reboot and we have a very distributed, potentially distributed if things go right. Hopefully. Hey, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully it should be distributed if people behave and if the poli- if we elected politician a very distributed bottoms up economy, which should help SMBs as well, which you, which selling to SMBs, which you're talking about. All right. We nailed it. Or you nailed it. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think you're the guy on the roof. So, so hopefully they find you those three knuckleheads. You don't want to be, you don't want to be uh, this guy. I feel okay. like I'm that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like when I went well, to of course, the, everybody'd like to be this guy in, in, in general. Bradley there, is Cooper. No, there is no that guy. Yeah. There's only one that guy. And that's why that yeah. movie was so successful. Right. We're all the guy on your left. Yeah. Uh, you know, we may not have lost our teeth. We kind of all, you know, I do have many friends who have the baby there on the right. You know? <laughs> They're not VCs. And they do uh, like weed. They do definitely like the weed. And they may have even having their day soon, too. You know? Are you, uh, are you as bullish as I am on the next couple of years? Yeah, it's hard. For, I just, I get scared because it's too easy. And I see, um, uh, you know, I do both sides. So... So I've never been more bullish on seed because I'm seeing so many smart people leave organizations that are just giving it one more shot. And, you know, I worry that they don't have the go to market experience, but they're just so smart. Um, And so, you know, do I want to amend 400 people on a zoom versus three people on a zoom? I'll take the risk. I'll leave my good job because I just don't want to live another year, you know, motivating millennials over zoom and just motivate three. Um, so I think that combined with the fact that it's a bottoms up economy and you could be in Kansas or you could be in Phoenix, yeah. you know, I was early to Phoenix and I just think, you know, Phoenix, Denver, Austin, Nashville, Miami, by the way, by the way, the common thread, those are well-run cities for now. Listen, if they raise taxes and you know, they, they're, they're semi well-run you, you, uh, I'm not going to just boast about Phoenix, but yeah, the, um, and because Coronado is well run, it just depends on your local. We need right. good local people running these places. I think, like you said, like we stop watching who our politicians was, and we stop watching the local news, and all of a sudden everything's a, a Starbucks and everything's you know the same, and we're overpaying for things. But it's hard for me not to be bullish on early stage because we're capacity constrained. So all this money only makes early stage better to me because as long as we stay in our lane, and I hate you know we hate telling people to stay in their lane, staying in your lane in my business, I think matters because it's capacity constraint. And if you Mm -hmm. can keep, if you can keep your ego in check and not go after the the 2% on assets under management and really focus on the 20%, I think, you know, we're compete, our competitors move up a weight class all the time and and we keep trying to focus on what we do. So I'm, I'm bullish on that. I'm bullish on the markets only because there's not enough good supply. Right. And so until I see more Nikolas, like, you know, you're going to see a lot of more of those Teslas because no one's checking, but that's okay. That's still better than tokens. And it's still better than Goldman yeah. and, and Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan controlling the float. People have to learn. Right. And they're going to learn pretty quickly with the Teslas of the world, that they can't just have yeah. a guy go up on, on with no sales on Twitter and be trusted. Right. Well, he did. And he raised, he became a billionaire. Yeah. On nothing. Right. There's no proof he has anything. Yeah, but we're also seeing Chamath is like substack of bankers, right? He he is going to be as good, as long as he does his work, he's able to be the promoter, the money raiser, the 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 banker, the showman, the media guy for that company. Whoever you know, that's a good deal for that company. You know, Goldman says they do all this stuff for you, but they don't go on CNBC for an hour in a trusted way. We're, we're, we're an investor in open door. So, yeah. so yes. So, I'm, I'm, but but they, Goldman doesn't do that for you. Goldman goes on CNBC, like, no one trusts him. Chamath goes on CNBC, everybody on Stocktoots. I, I turn around one day, everybody on Stocktoots loves Chamath. I'm like, I didn't see that coming. They love David. Well, the thing, the, the, the brilliance I will say of him, <clears throat> you know, and, and he obviously ruffles some people the wrong way, but the sure. thing that he is brilliant at is saying, look, I'm only going to own a couple things. And I'm going to bet on things that have huge long-term potential. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to concentrate my money in those things. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of validity. Modern Warren, he's channeling modern Warren Buffett. 
for exactly. years, for yeah. years, there's nobody, I, I'm not going to argue with, with the Kramer world. This is the Yahoo Google world. Yahoo was a beautiful idea of finance. We'll, give, we'll break down the list, right? And then Google came along and, and flipped it. Yeah. Kramer comes along in business and he's like, Yahoo, you got to come to me and I'll tell you, I'll give you an opinion on every stock on the market. Okay. That worked. Carnival barking of uh, uh, stocks work. And, and I thought that would have been disrupted fucking 15 years ago. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's what I got wrong. But now you ask me if I'm bullish, I'm super bullish because we just entered the phase of zero commission. A thousand yeah. Robin hood clones will be birthed powered by alpaca yeah. drive wealth. Uh, more modern plaids for banking and brokerage. Okay, so you, you put that combination together with new talking heads, which is Dave Portnoy. Split between sports and stocks, no doubt. Probably will head back towards stock. But here's a guy learning in real time with real money, sharing those trades. Not right. stupid family it. Kramer family trust. It's no transparency. He's putting his trades online. Hey and guys, I bet forty thousand. You believe him. I love it. I love it when he goes, I put 40,000 on whatever it yeah. is, you know, KBNR. I don't know what they do, but I'm, I'm down. I'm out of this thing. <laughs> That's how you learn. Now, he's learning with more money than the average person, but they still relate. Then you have Chamath, who's, who's the opposite of Kramer. He goes and eloquently speaks a deep on a subject, right or wrong. He, he, he mostly right. He has a big long term. He's not a, he's not carnival barking 700 tickers. Right. It's not a show. No, no, no. no. It's a process. And he. And I'm very happy that, you know, at first I was like a little upset as, as, as someone who's been wanting to be partly that person and, and onboarded all these people. But I'm so happy that it's finally happened. If it's Chamath and Dave Portnoy, great, because yeah. we needed a new band of people. You're right. It's a good way to look at it. To that. Just like the three guys behind you, their antics led to, that's the last funny movie. I'm serious. There hasn't been a funny laugh out loud movie since that scene those yeah, first we're, 10 we're minutes missing, of that movie that genre the wedding crashers uh okay missing. not as good as that that genre, you have not had a slapstick laugh out loud oh my god that's kind of happened to me movie since then <laughs> and we and that's 15 20 years ago and we were the same way in finance so that's why i'm bullish yeah right? now with that comes a lot of people doing stupid things i get it okay but uh, people will learn. So, you know, our job, like this is why I love talking to you, is to educate these people. It's like there's, there's you know, it's risky. There's PE wow. contraction that's coming. Everybody thinks rates are going to stay at zero forever. It's possible. It could go negative. I'm not, the trend is there. But yeah. be prepared. If it doesn't, no one's written into their script 4% 10-year rates. Yeah, I was that talking would, to shoppers. That would, I was that talking would to some guys over the weekend and they said, well, one of the guys said, well, I think the market could go down 20, 30%. And I said, yeah, it could okay, I'll take a look at the names I love and I'll buy more because yeah. I believe in 10 years, they'll be higher. Yeah. Now I'm not, but I'm not trading, right? Cause in California, we, we pay a pretty big penalty to trade because we're paying 13% plus federal. So just own good long-term ideas. The wealthiest people I know bought, you know, whether stocks or land or whatever, and just sit on them. That's great advice. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. You have minimize investing for profit and draw. You'll pass it on to the next generation. Uh, next time we'll have a different say. I'm going to something from the Godfathers behind you next time.